introduction to you so that you can better understand. Prophase is promoting pharma experimentation and innovation in Sahel. Prophase is a research action to improve the to improve the quality of uh, pharma innovation. And uh, this program has been until 2007. We are on the fourth phase of three years. Now, a pro phase is a program that try to create a dialogue so that different partners can exchange positively and uh, uh, constructively. Now, in a, a profess, use an approach called participatory innovation or development, PID. Uh, PID. The approach is based on one thing. Instead of starting with the problems of farmers, this approach starts with the solution of the farmers. That's the particularity of this approach. To do so, there is an approach uh, called, uh, and I say already, is the PID. Now, we did uh, different uh, to get that. Uh, 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 to make this approach, we have four components. One is identification, characterization, uh, and validation of pharma innovations. Two is to, to make a joint experimentation. In that experimentation, pharma is in the center. And the other partners like the research, extension people, NGOs, uh, other uh, farmers will come to help the farmer do yeah. to solve his problem. And then the, the third component is the uh, capitalization and diffusion of the most uh, uh, relevant innovation, uh, farmer innovation. And the last is the institutionalization of uh, the PIG. So, uh, we did for the four components, we identified 103 pharma innovation. Now, let me explain to you what we mean by pharma innovation. We mean by pharma innovation, we, a process that we use to identify the creative something that a farmer was able to create himself or was able to add some other people create, uh, uh, technology but adding something. Another word, in order to be a farmer innovation, you can take it a uh, modern technology but you make sure that you add something. That's one way. Or the farmer just have to create himself and innovation done. Based on that, if, uh, once the innovation has been identified and validated, we, we, we try to sort out the best one, and that will be the joint experimentation. As I said before, as I said before, when we talk about joint experimentation, the farmer is at the same. Now, we get a lot of farmer innovation, and I'm going, the one that I'm going to present now is one of the innovation that we found that is, is uh, relevant. Uh, what is the name? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, one of the innovation that we made joint experimentation is a woman, a farmer woman, that found out a, a solution to the problem that all the people that in the village were facing. The problem was what? It was about the depredator 
that was uh, just destroying their crops and we choose tomatoes to show how the destruction was done. So the lady named the farmer name was Anata Trawe. Now, so tomato is one of the main vegetable crops for women in Mali. Its production during the season and off season is most of the time facing some important parasite, parasites, parasites, constraints in which in the extreme infestation situation can destroy the whole harvest.
1.5 liters dose, and the low estrogen number was 60 with the control. No, and here is the, the plan. Now, in terms of revenue of women and men producers, the increase of the number of fruits and the yield and the quality has increased the significantly the revenue of the women, the women production on tomatoes and dealing with the solution of the food Now, this is the amount of, uh, you see, yeah. When you look at also the weight of the tomatoes in less square, one to the square meter, the average plot was uh, 13, uh, uh, 19, while the other was 16. Yeah, in, uh, in terms of gaining, you can see the differences. One is 4,722, and the control was 2,000. And the completion of the use of the solution for the portable libo has greatly increased the total production of tomatoes and increased as significant as was a significant for the revenue of old, old women. The founder innovation is uh, the founder innovation has been the real alternative for women producers of tomatoes. In perspective, over efforts should be made for the identification of the active principle of this plant that is portable libo that has been increased in the production of women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for... Sorry, with my English and some part. No, no, I'm going to translate. Madam, do you have the photograph of the Potocola Limbo plant? Yeah, I'll show you. Uh, that is the tomato. No, no, the, the, the one that was green. Ah. That's the Potocola Limbo. You it have to cultivate along with the tomato. It grows along with the tomato plant? That's what I want. Okay. Yeah. The, you mean to a particular limbo? No, it will not serve, but you have to collect. Okay. Uh, uh, director, Walker uh, Wallach, uh, uh, assistive technologies and education of young blind people. Now I am given to understand that there are many speakers in this session. So there is time constraint. We already we started with uh, very <coughs> Or I can do all the slides. So okay. pardon? I could do five minutes with no slides. Yeah, I think that will be better. Okay. If you put all speakers in the future now, can you take five to seven minutes and just highlight what is the, the achievement rather than giving details of the experiment. We don't need to know what we need is that this was the problem, this has been done, this is innovation, and this is the I think that will happen. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ted Moalan, and uh, uh, as mentioned, um, I have an educational trust called Makerwala, based in Chhattisgarh. Um, but actually, I'm talking to you uh, now about another trust uh, on, in Meghalaya, in Shillong, uh, which is called Blind Lead Trust. And that one I have formed together with a group of young blind people. Um, the Blind Lead Initiative, um, I have initially started this in Tamil Nadu uh, around 2010. Initially it was a technology initiative. Um, my first motivations were uh, finding out that um, a braille typewriter costs something like 40,000 rupees. Um, and my first thoughts were, uh, as an engineer, um, it cannot possibly cost 40,000 rupees in order to make braille docs on paper. And so I spent a while um, trying to figure out why, uh, why the price of a, a braille typewriter um, was so high, why it hadn't come down. And the, um, the, the story there is, is very interesting, and I'm not going to, uh, to go into detail about that now, except to say that uh, there are a lot of um, uh, forces at work in the assistive technology market that we're not seeing. Uh, the normal process of development that happens with, say, uh, toothpaste or cello tape, it doesn't happen with devices for the blind. Whether that's a slate and stylus for making braille or whether it's an electronic cane, um, prices don't fall from their initial levels. Um, improvements don't get made based on user feedback. And 
Uh, by 2014, when I visited to Meghalaya, I was realizing that there's just a fundamental lack of empowerment uh, of, of blind people. And um, fortunately, around the same time, I met a group of young blind people um, and uh, who are interested, who were interested in changing that. So uh, one of these people, Jitendra Dakar, uh, he's a, a, a tribal um, uh, from the Gentia uh, tribal people, and um, a group of friends. Most of them are Gentia and, and Kasi. Um, they're interested in uh, in basically creating awareness among young blind people in the society, and creating awareness among those people in positions of authority. So uh, I'll just take two more minutes. I want to basically introduce you to Jitendra Dakar, uh, who's uh, uh, not here right now, but he's a 25-year-old uh, blind man. He's highly, highly intelligent. Um, but what really differentiates him is that uh, he doesn't take no for an answer. So despite the fact that he's coming from uh, a village in West Jantia Hills, far away from the city, um, despite the fact that he has only a class 3 education, um, well, when he first went to SBI and tried to make a bank account, they told him that uh, you know, blind people can't have a bank account, you have to have a joint account uh, with someone else. He knew that's not true, it took him a long time, but he fought that, he got a bank account. Then he wanted an ATM card, and he had to start all over again. Um, and he fought, and he got an ATM card. Now, if you've seen uh, ATM machines, they're actually equipped for blind people to use them. There's a place where you can put your earphone uh, into the jack. There's um, dots and bumps and braille on them. People went to a lot of work to make these machines accessible. And yet last week, when Jitendra was on the phone with his, uh, his branch manager, the branch manager is telling him, no, 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 blind people cannot use ATM cards. He certainly cannot make a deposit in a, uh, a branch of SBI in Shillong. He has to go all the way back to his village and make a deposit in person there. And uh, Dutendra recorded that, right? He recorded that, and um, uh, we're, we're trying to figure out what to do with it. This is a, a very clear violation of a uh, young person's rights. Um, but the fact is that this is happening uh, continuously. So um, rather than just leave Jitendra fighting this on his own, what we've done is to come up with a, uh, a program. So this is, it's now a registered trust, registered in, in Megalia called Blind Lead Trust. And lead is for leaders, right? So there are notions that when the blind lead the blind, they're in trouble. Uh, actually, uh, with Jitendra leading them, we've now um, started to educate a group of young blind people, um, well, one, about their rights. Um, but just as importantly, um, uh, about uh, Android phones. Right? Most people uh, don't really think about it, but a touchscreen phone these days can be completely accessible to a blind person. Right? Um, for this program, um, uh, Jitendra decided that English has been invaluable to him. Right? I would have never connected with him if he wasn't trying his best to speak English. Um, so we're teaching English to, to these young blind people. Uh, we're taking in our first 10 fellows now. They're all um, uh, tribal people, young blind, fully blind. Uh, so far we don't have anyone who's uh, partially sighted. And uh, first thing we do is we find a donor who gets them a, a, a 5,000 rupees Android phone, and we start to show them how to use that. And at the same time, the phone talks to them in English. They start to learn English. Um, and the goal is to create a, a new generation of blind leaders, of um, uh, those people who have the, the passion, the commitment, the determination, uh, not just to get rights for themselves, but to change things, to change the way that young blind people view themselves, and to change the way that society uh, views them. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred, and wish you all the best with your initiative and uh, good work that you are doing for those who need assistive uh, technologies. Next. Uh,
speaker we have is uh, Mr. Baljit Singh, who has been with the State Bank of India all through his life and now uh, immigrated to New Zealand. And he would tell us uh, again about some assistive innovation. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Paroda. I am really very proud. Uh, to hear my name from Dr. Prada, he's my guru. He was my teacher for a very, very long time in the HAU Hisar, then he went as a VC to talk about that, and in my meeting with him after many years, I migrated to New Zealand some 10 years ago after I took retirement from State Bank of India. Well, I had an elaborate uh, presentation, but since I know the time is a constraint, I won't go into that. Uh, New Zealand is the most economically invested country in livestock production. And it is the newest country to go into agriculture, whether this is crop production, fruits, or animals. You will be surprised, it has only a history of 200 years only of the agriculture and livestock production. Before that, there was no agriculture or animal production by the name of it. 200 years ago, it started with farmers' innovations, and the entire economy of New Zealand is represented by farmers' grassroots innovation. The first government intervention came in 2001 only, after so many years when the progress had taken place in the livestock and everything. In first New Zealand development, dairy development board was established in 2001, and the Agriculture Institute was established for this purpose. Unfortunately, that institute we started is now on the brink of closure because their institutes have to st stand up on their own income and they have to earn their own income. They don't thrive on government grants like our universities or our institutions. And there is not much takers for the technology developed by that institution and it could not repay the loans it has faced. Why I said this is this is because the technology is totally driven in that country by farmers. And so intense is the technology. Uh, my learned friend from China presented about the management of uh, waste. That New Zealand has no grass waste at all. Whether it's wheat, we produce wheat, we produce barley in a very small area. But mostly it is a grassland and there is no waste. They use their entire production and waste in the farm itself and there are no equipment which goes in it. Now to talk of technology. The serious concern came up in that country that you are a meat producer and meat eater. You are causing a lot of, or the meat eaters in general in the world are causing a lot of threat to the environment and to the health of the consumers. There is a huge carbon print associated with 1 kg production of the protein from the animal origin, the efficiency of conversion of protein from source grain to animal is hardly 10%. So what happens? That the ill effect on health and the environment, the kiwis got up and said, well, we are the one which will be attacked because we produce basically this, we won't produce food. But it's a uniqueness and everything. These many new innovators came up and over the last 10 years, the meat consumption was cut down by 56%. The consumption from 35 kg was cut down to 19 kg per person per year, the meat consumption, only because a lot of younger people took to vegetarian meal and the artificial protein products created by the innovators. The one case I would like to refer, very typical is, of young Auckland chef, Shama Lee. She came to study from Fiji, and after she became a chef, she dreamt that why can't we replace meat with vegetables. And she turned, developed recipes, that she turned peas, mutter, into very tasty chicken meat, like non meat food. And Nessie University, a very leading university of New Zealand, partnered with her in that venture and that venture was so successful that Air New Zealand flying from San Francisco to Auckland serves such type of non-meaty meal burger. 
So this is the extent of innovation which are taking place in every corner of the world. They are taking place in our country here also. But what I see is this need for such platforms where grassroots innovators from various parts of the world come across each other and then they share and inspire that how the people have been making a lot of difference in the life of the people, in the life of the world, in the life of this country. Thank you very much. Thank you for keeping to the time. Appreciate it very much. And uh, uh, also about uh, innovative thoughts of being vegetarian. Uh, the next uh, speaker we have is Dr. Madhurima Chattopadhyaya. Five minutes, Madhurima.